Hello, this is Dr. Harriet Fraud with Capitalism Hits Home, a program about the intersection of big political issues, economic issues, and our personal lives. Today, I want to talk about the women's liberation movement, now called the feminist movement. I have both a scholarly interest in that and also personal experience as a founding mother since 1968, which was actually the second wave of the women's movement, came in the late 60s. 1965 was Betty Friedan's book, and by 1968, there was the first women's liberation organization. And it's captured in the book Revolution, and some of the documents are also in Rosalind Baxendall and Linda Gordon's history book. At any rate, what happened to our movement, which began with the idea that we at the bottom, black and white together, if we stood up, we could bring everyone with us because we were at the bottom. How did that movement, which grew out of the left, out of the protests against the war in Vietnam and the radical movement that wanted a more egalitarian society in the 60s, become inflicted with the kind of corporate feminism of Hillary Clinton, who against Bernie's advocacy of a $15 minimum wage, advocated instead $12.50, even though two-thirds of minimum wage workers are women, often women with children. Or Sheryl Sandberg, CEO at Facebook's book, Leaning In, which is how women at the top should support each other. And she talks about how anyone can do it as a woman. You can have children and also have a brilliant career. And she doesn't mention in her book, something I found out later, which that she had nine full-time servants, which of course helps raising children, doing housework, so that you have time and energy for a career. At any rate, how did this happen? How did the movement go from equality, wanting equality for all, morph into an equality for women within a system of ever greater inequality. The movement really, second wave is started in 1968 with notes from the first year, periodical from the women's liberation movement, the first one. How did it go from advocating equality for all to equality within a system of vast inequality in the United States? In 1970, America was the most egalitarian nation of all the developed wealthy nations. Now it's the least. And now the demands for economic equality are not really known as part of the feminist movement. Well, what happened? One of the things that happened was that the CIO, the CIA, <laughs> the CIA put vast amounts of money, hundreds of thousands, which went, of course, went far further because the American dollar was worth about 10 times more at that time. So it put vast thousands into agents who were to help change the women's liberation mo movement to a gender-only movement, leaving the class system intact. At the same time, it put an equal wealth of agents into the civil rights movement to make sure that the civil rights movement became a black power movement for race only, with enemies being white people, as in the gender movement, enemies were men. Not a gender system, not capitalism that benefits so much from separating its workers and paying blacks less, women's less, and women less. 
but a gender-only movement. One of the ways it did that was with Ms. Magazine, and we were so naive back then. We th I remember discussing with people what a terrific thing it was that we now had Ms. Magazine, a beautiful, glossy magazine without ads to promote our cause. Oh, we were so naive. We didn't think, well, who's paying for it then if there's no ads? And it turns out, sure enough, the CIA and Gloria Steinem herself was a highly paid, very successful CIA agent. She began by going to youth festivals in Europe where communist countries and socialist countries as well as capitalist countries got together with their youth and talked about their country and their politics. And she was supposed to find the Americans interested in socialism and communism and rat them out to the CIA. She did so well at her job that she got promoted. And she spearheaded the movement to make with their vast thousands to help her our women's liberation movement into a feminist movement for gender only. Changing women's access to equality within a system of vastly unequal and ever more economically and class unequal society. Well, how did she do it? Partly it was the slow isolation of class discussions from periodicals, and Ms. was the most popular of feminist periodicals, and it was free and sent to us by the thousands with no ads. Of course not. It was paid for. Naive us didn't think about that. And it encouraged us to set up alternative organizations for women, rape crisis centers, battered women's shelters, women's clinics, and in setting those clinics up to look for state money, to look for private money, to look for money all the time, to set up an alternative rather than make a mass demand that the state provide for rape crisis centers and battered women's shelters for women and their families leaving homes of battery. And Clinics where women's reproductive concerns could be honored and treated. Look what's happening now that the right wing is doing to Planned Parenthood, which was given a huge boost at that time. And the demand was not there that the state should take over these important duties that allow women to be equals in society. but rather to set up alternative institutions that took a lot of our work and energy and required complying with the state and city authorities and with the wealthy people who founded them. Grant writing, staffing, all those things you need to do when you set up an alternative institution. So that was part of it. Another part of it was a steady stream of propaganda pushing women that men were the problem. Gloria Steinem's contribution was a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. So instead of saying, look, we all need to work together to change all those things that divide us, or even to say that women who have been so deferential to men sometimes need separate meetings so that we can speak out because we're intimidated and in a man and woman co-educational group. That's a valid concern. Or that blacks need some separate meetings because they're used to listening to whites over each other in a racist society. That's okay. But instead, it was a separatist movement to keep us apart for obvious reasons. Because if people at the bottom realize their common cause, the tiny minority at the top is in trouble. So that was part of it. The CIA and the constant stream of propaganda, as well as those things that were racist 
and sexist from the start that were part of our history. As early as the American Revolution, Jane Addams has very famous writings to her husband, John Adams, in the original government and original signer of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. That, wait a minute, what about the other half of the population? But by keeping women in a subordinate position, you kept women taking care of the mass of, work, of the workforce, and you gave men a feudal prerogative, that they were the head of the feudal manor, which was the home. And they had full-time servants in women, full-time sexual servants, full-time housekeepers, full-time connectors with themselves, relatives, friends, full-time emotional workers to help them feel better, after a hard and exploited day at work, and also help keep a family system which pushes men not to organize because women need the money to keep the household going and you have divisions within the family of the man who wants to go on strike and the woman who needs the funds to keep the household going rather than a man and woman on strike together who understand each other's plight. And so it was a very clever ploy that has its tentacles squeezing the women's movement to this day, keeping men and women separate when together we can make a change and individually and separately we can't. Another way was that since men and women were to have completely separate organization, the women's movement would not allow men. It wasn't that we needed some separate groups in order to figure out what our voices were in consciousness raising, which were small groups where women talked together to figure out what are, what are our lives like? What are the things that bother us? What should be our platform, which is a very democratic way to figure out our platform, something which has gone by the wayside, but is basic democracy in figuring out the platform of any organization. What bothers people? How can we decide on issues that we want to champion together? And so since you separated out men from women, gay women were able to bring their lovers to meetings and were encouraged in their love choice. And straight women were condemned and their lovers were and husbands were excluded. So that you had a whole push towards the gay movement, which should be supported, but not instead of, but alongside the movement for men and working women's equal rights everywhere. And because of that, 43% of the American workforce that are women are in what is called pink collar trades. They're in professions and in jobs overwhelmingly performed by women, whether it's home health aides, some of the most poorly paid, paid less than parking lot attendants, or early childhood education workers, who are paid also less than parking lot attendants to take care of children because it's women's work so you can pay less for it. You can subordinate a whole part of the working class that has to work into women's jobs that are considered lower. And of course, you don't have to do that. Jacinda Ardern, who is a heroine of any women's liberation movement and is the prime minister of New Zealand, a much beloved prime minister who got 70% of the vote of the vote last time she's a socialist labor candidate and in new zealand i should say that over 80% of the people vote who are entitled to vote whereas in the united states it's less than half at any rate jacinda ardern the socialist labor 
Prime Minister of New Zealand, had a very bold initiative in which she took traditional women's jobs who were who are staffed in New Zealand by the Maori, who were the original settlers, the first settlers of New Zealand, and who are darker people, called Aboriginal people. And all women, it's overwhelmingly women, early childhood workers and home health care aides, the aides in the hospital, the orderlies, the custodians and janitors who are women and people of color, the social workers, the women's professions, which are paid less than the male dominated professions, the nurses, the social workers, the primary school teachers, all paid less. And she took those jobs and the skills that are needed. For example, a nurse's aide or a home health care worker often has to carry heavy people because if you're a home health aide, you have to lift people to bathe them. You have to lift them when they collapse. You have to move them from one place to another. And she equated those with heavy lifting jobs in factories and in trucking and made them equivalent and therefore got the salaries of those higher jobs. She took the skills, she found out what they were, she matched them up with where they pay in male jobs. And those workers across the board, whether they're emotional workers like counselors or therapists or social workers or emotional workers like home health care workers and nurses aides and nurses, and gave them the equivalent pay for the skills that they have to show. And so across the board, all those workers got a 30.5% increase in their salaries, as well as the respect that goes with higher wages. That's what women's liberation needs to do. That's what we wanted to do from the very beginning. That was what was usurped from us by the CIA to try to keep a class divided America with the mass of people at the bottom. And with room at the top for those people, those women like Sheryl Sandberg, those 3% of women who make over $150,000 a year to join the male ranks because they have the money and because they're making that money. And to erase the idea that this is, that America is not democratic because we have equality of opportunity. Quite a stretch. And the lesson here is the lesson all over the place that feminists need to get together with people fighting racism, fighting climate change, and um, with a class basis so that class equality, no one hugely rich, no one desperately poor, no Jeff Bezos spending $500 million entertaining himself further by going into space while the homeless are crowding the streets. No more. That's what we have to stand for. Anyway, thank you for listening and watching. I hope you tell your friends about it and get them to watch too. I hope that you groove on the message. I hope you respond and send your comments to Democracy at Work for Capitalism Hits Home. And again, thank you, Patreon subscribers, for keeping this operation going. And thank you for Democracy at Work for organizing this and making it possible. Goodbye for now.